All right. Thank you, Danielle. Of course. Welcome committee, committee members, liaisons, and members of the public to today's Legal Services Trust Fund Commission Homelessness Prevention Funds Committee meeting. Thank you for joining us. We are using Zoom with the goal to foster a more inclusive environment and effective meeting. If you would like to comment during the meeting, please use the raised hand feature. To use the raised hand feature by phone, dial star nine on your phone's dial pad to raise your hand and the same star nine to lower your hand. Please utilize this tool to virtually indicate that you would like to speak in order to help the chair facilitate the discussion. Going forward, all commission and committee meetings will be recorded and posted to the State Bar website. A friendly reminder that this is a video conference and to please be aware of your surroundings behind you. And finally, some quick troubleshooting tips. For those using Zoom on a computer, when on mute, holding down the space bar will temporarily unmute you. If you use your phone to dial into this meeting, please be sure your computer's microphone is on mute to avoid audio feedback issues. And while joining audio via computer is highly recommended, if an individual loses audio, they can call in separately using the Zoom conference number. Thanks. Um, thank you, Danielle. Um, Jim, if you'd like, hey. staff can take roll. Yeah, thanks, Danielle. Uh, go ahead and start the roll, Chris. Okay, uh, Meeker. Here. Uh, Aflagi. Absent, Alsaroff. Also absent, Iskin. Here. Mahoney. Here. Uh, Rhinus. Here. Savage. Iskin. Here. And Schreiber. Sure. Um, we do have a quorum, Jim, and I'll um, call for liaisons. Uh, Selena Copeland. I don't see, but I do see Lauren. I hope it's okay that I, uh, Jim, promoted Lauren for Black because I think maybe she's sure. attending for Selena. Okay. Yeah. Hi, Lauren. Uh, Bonnie Huff. Hi. Um, and Melanie Snyder. And then for State Bar staff, uh, Duan Nguyen. Yeah. And Chris, um, Kim Kim is from the Judicial Council is on too. Oh, hi, Kim. Hi. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> welcome. Yay. Okay, so Bonnie and Kim from the Judicial Council. Thank you, Dawn. Um, thanks for joining us, Kim. Uh, Chris McConkey is here. Uh, Danielle McRae. Here. Uh, Michael Chang. I did see Michael. Here. Michael. Hi. Uh, and, then, and Brady Dewar is not here. All right. And that is the um, end of uh, roll call, Jim. Okay, uh, I guess we call for public comment next. Uh, yeah, so um, I, I see uh, two members of the public in the attendee room. Uh, we have someone whose name is GK Client and William, and, and William might even be your fellow commissioner, uh, William um, Bichelli, or it could be a different William, but if any member of the um, of the um, public in the attendee room would like to make a comment, please use the raise hand feature. It's located at the bottom of your screen. And we'll give you a few seconds to do that. Okay, so I'm not seeing any raised hands, Jim, but if I, we'll keep an eye on the, uh, the attendee room if anyone else joins or if GK Klein or William. Ah, uh, I see uh, uh, GK uh, Client did raise a hand, so I'm gonna, give you the ability to talk in just a moment. Okay, welcome. So you, you are on mute. If, you, um, if you'd like to make public comment, please unmute yourself. Hi, thanks, sorry for the delay. My name is Amber Galloway. I am um, one of the recent former clients of Girardi Keys. And um, just this week, I saw that these committee meetings are going on. I wasn't aware of them. And this one strikes my interest. Um, I have no idea what you guys are talking about or what's on the agenda. So I'm just going to be in the wings, like, observing. Um, but I wanted to just quickly introduce myself and say thank you for all you guys are doing for us. Absolutely. Thank you for, for attending the <laughs> Homelessness Prevention Funds Committee meeting. We love it. Uh, well, well, I'm going to put you uh, back into the, the public uh, attendee room and then, um, but you'll, you'll be able to continue to listen to the community. Okay, so thank, thank you for you. joining. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Uh, 
Next on the agenda would be approval of the minutes. Uh, but before we get into that, I wanted to bring up a discussion I had with Chris yesterday about uh, some of the wording in the minutes. And um, since it's an issue that's peculiar to me, I wanted to raise it all with the commission first before uh, we do any specific changes. And part of this comes from um, my involvement uh, with the appendix I review and participating with the working group as an advisor, which Rich chaired. And my recollection, and these are my opinions only, and I'm gonna give Rich an opportunity and Christian also since they were participants to correct any misconceptions that I may have. But in my opinion, uh, that review um, was run a lot by an outside consultant who in my opinion had a very hostile view of the commission as well as the Access to Justice Commission, which I was serving on at the time. Um, but in particular, uh, he had strong criticisms on how our grant uh, review process worked, in particular on the bank grants. Uh, he felt that grantees had too much control over what they were evaluated on. He also had strong opinions about the working group and mischaracterize or the, um, the reboot group, sorry, and mischaracterize this work as, um, well, he didn't appreciate what we were trying to do with standardized metrics on the reporting form, which was the, the, the mission of that particular uh, group. But because of that hostility, or I think because of the hostility, several recommendations were made. One is to eliminate the commission entirely, have all the grants administered by staff, staff only. And then there was a proposal to reduce, if you collect it as a commission, to reduce it down to a membership of eight, which as we all know, just eight people administering all the grants, discretionary grants that this commission handles is an unacceptably small number. Um, but because of that, and because of worried about a misconception about undue delegation to staff, I was concerned since this particular grant round, we're using a very different uh, granting uh, process or review process uh, using the scoring team to score everything after overall uh, committee reviewed the, the scoring metrics to get some sort of standardization. And then the scoring team bringing back uh, issues or problematic um, reviews, uh, those particular grants to the, to the committee as a whole. And so I wanted to make it perfectly clear in the minutes that when certain staff were reporting certain things that if they were to identify them as members of the scoring team, or if they weren't, identify them just as staff and make it perfectly clear that commission, the committee members represented by me was involved in that scoring team. And that any time that the scoring team is mentioned in the minutes, if you're going to list the name of some of the scoring team, you should list the names of all of the scoring team. So if somebody looks at these minutes four years from now and looks at how they're written up, it wants to be perfectly clear that this was not a delegation, a complete delegation to staff in terms of this review process, but it was an active involvement with the committee. Now, I may be overly sensitive. So before we open this up to general discussion, I'd like to invite Rich, if you have a different impression of the review process, appendix, excuse me, the appendix I process, and also uh, uh, a Christian too, because he was an active member of that group. Uh, just, uh, I'll, I'll hop in first, Jim. I think you accurately described the consultant's point of view. I don't think it was shared by many of the um, members of the working group. Uh, and I think certain of the proposals, for instance, the reduction of the number of commissioners to a, an unwieldy uh, and small number were rejected out of hand. Um, but I do think that the hostility was evident. To be honest, I'm not sure the consultant was the um, principal progenitor of that point of view. I think uh, the consultant worked closely with others in forming that view uh, and those others may not have been fully informed as to the work of the commission. I think it is a very wise suggestion that references be made that are complete and that um, in this particular case, your participation was not uh, in a supervisory role, but in fact, uh, at the staff level, uh, assisting and making decisions with staff. Uh, and I, I, I applaud your efforts in that regard and it's wise to keep our eye on this. Chris? <clears throat> um, 
So yeah, I, I agree with what both Jim and Rich said, and I will. I don't think we need to revisit the appendix I working group process, but I will say, Jim, I think you're you've put your finger on an important point, and I, I think that is a smart thing to do to to um, make the minutes reflect your involvement. The only thing I would add is that, to me, the um, the creation of these metrics is uh, it, it just it stands in contrast to how it was done in the past, which was that there were a, there was a, a holistic review by the full contingent of mission members who were appointed. And so it has sort of whittled down the, the number of commission members that are reading sort of every every grant application. And you know the the reasons for that may make sense, but just the same, uh, I I think that process was unbroken um, at the time. So I, that's, that would be my only point. I, I didn't mind that process. Well, let's open it up to general discussion. Any other points of view? Yeah, Kim has her hand raised. Um, I just wanted you to clarify, Jim, if you are suggesting in the minutes that when we reference the work of commission members, we you specifically want to mention the, the name of the individual or just reference um, commission member? Because for the general minutes of the trust fund commission, um, I don't think people are typically named um, if they comment. And that's done for a lot of obvious reasons. <laughs> um, and so I think mentioning that, you know, that the chair said such and such, or the chair was involved in such and such, or a com or a commissioner. But I, I I'm not. I, I would not propose going so far as to be naming actual individuals. Go on. Um, you know, maybe for this, if I can offer maybe a compromise. Um, for, for maybe this particular minutes, um, we, we should definitely highlight, Jim, that you were in fact on the scoring team. But um, if, if, if you all don't mind, like maybe putting a pin in it, because there's a standard that we use now to take um, action summaries. And it actually, the state bar is revisiting it for all the sub entities. There's gonna be a proposal that's gonna come out. The Trust Fund Commission is obviously not, um, uh, uh, subjected to it because we of uh, SB 211, but there'll be a proposal that will come out and then it'll be up to us whether we want to adopt it. Um, so this could be, you, you know, it, it might not be a, an issue if you see a proposal that comes out to standardize everything, but I, I think I, I see your point, Jim, in terms of like um, it, uh, the review process was a little bit modified for this particular grant. So maybe we just um, change it to make it very clear that you were part of the review team, it was a commissioner and not just purely staff led. But then in terms of like, um, generally speaking, um, naming a commissioner or staff, um, we have gotten the feedback from both staff and commissioners that sometimes um, people don't want to be named in the action summary. So we moved away from that practice. There are times when we still do because it's important for whatever reason, but but generally but uh, practices, we just say commissioner has said this or staff has said that. So we can just stay with that just, just for another month or two until we get the proposal. And I'll float the proposal um, through XCOM and then it'll come down through um, all the sub entities. Hey, Eric. Yeah, I, I don't have a real uh, point of view about whether we should tweak the, the, these particular minutes or not. Um, I just wanted to say that um, from my perspective, I thought these minutes were exceptionally well written. And uh, as chair of the Partnership Grants Committee, where we're undergoing a similar process, um, I'm suggesting that we use them as a template, actually, or that, that, we, that we learn from the way you describe the process and, and try to emulate it. So, you know, frankly, from my perspective, kudos to the minutes writers and to everyone who was involved in the process. I thought it was great. 
Uh, okay. Well, to answer uh, Kim, uh, I'm not proposing listing everybody whoever makes any comments. That that wasn't it. It was just a discrepancy of one month's minutes. They listed the scoring team as just by their status, that is their staff position and chair. And another one, they listed the staff positions and staff names. They didn't list my name. And I just think if you're gonna list names, you should list all the names involved. Uh, and as far as personally, I mean, I understand uh, Juan and they're having consistency on how you do these, but I don't say anything at these meetings since I view them as public. I don't say anything that I don't mind having my name attributed to. Uh, and I'll take the consequences, but I'm not asking to change the general reporting practices at all. And, and one, one other point, and it will come when we talk about the resolutions at the end, I had some suggestions on the, let's see, the further resolution that comes out of the same context, but we'll talk about that when we get to the resolutions. Yeah, Rich. Uh, I move under the circumstances move that we uh, amend the bad your name. Uh, at the appropriate place and otherwise approve the minutes as written. And with the one clarification, I hope that we make it clear that when we talk about staff, we're talking about staff who are members of the scoring team, as opposed to staffs that had nothing to do with the scoring team, to, to, to keep that clear. As so amended. Great, we got a second. Oh, so I am, I, I'm sorry, Jim, I just wanna make sure I captured it accurately. I've, um, so, because there's two sets of minutes, so th this is just for November 22, not for December 2nd, or is, is this suggestion going to be for both sets of minutes? This is for both okay. suggestions. Okay, so, but this vote is just for November 22. Right. Uh, and then we're going to vote on December 2. Okay, great. Okay. Um, thank you. Sorry to interrupt. So, uh, yeah, I have, was it uh, Rhinus moved? Yes. Great. Okay. I'll start him. Try for seconds. Just one moment. I'll take the roll. Um, okay. Uh, so Meeker. Yes. And uh, I think uh, Bonashi and Amin are still absent. I just want to check the participant in the waiting room. Yep. All right. And then Iskin. Yes. Mahoney. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, Rhinus. Yes. Savage. Yes. And Schreiber. Great, motion carries. And I guess, again, any further discussions on the second set of minutes? What is that, December 2nd? Uh, these are the December two minutes, that's right. Yeah. Same same amendments. Right. Okay. Yeah. So moved. Rhinus moves. Second. Driver seconds. Uh, and then taking the vote, Meeker? Yes. Great. Uh, Iskin? Yes. Mahoney? Yes. Uh, Rhinus? Yes. Savage? Yes. And Schreiber? Yes. Okay. And I think um, Aflagi and all Saraf are still absent, so motion carries. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, everybody. Um, all right, Jim. I, is the next item on their agenda the one request to revise an HP2 budget? Yeah, 4A. Um, and staff has a has like two slides on this. If you'd like, if, like I can go ahead and share my screen now. Let's bring this up. So it takes a moment for Zoom. Chris, this is on. This was posted. Uh, this was posted. Yes, yeah, this is agenda item four A. Um, and this was um, when you were looking at the materials. This was the spreadsheet, um, which I can also pull up and put on the screen too, if that's helpful. Okay. Before everyone votes. Um, so just a, a brief um, uh, uh, kind of like context, procedural history for this. The committees typically take grant budget revision requests, requests to revise in the fall. Usually committees try to, to process them by the end of the calendar year. So this was actually on the committee's agenda for December, but we needed all of that time to talk about the HP3 um, competitive grant. So we, we've moved this to the January meeting. Um, so this is kind of like a carryover item um, for to refresh everyone's memories. And maybe for Tammy, you might be hearing this for the first time. 
um, there's three thresholds for budget revision requests. So if a grantee, this is part of the, um, this is set out in the general grant provisions for the trust fund program. If the cumulative deviations in the budget are 10% or less of the total grant, it's what we call self-executing or self-approving. They don't actually even need to ask for permission. Um, it's, it's like automatically allowed. Uh, there were 10, so for the HP2 formula and competitive grants, which have just finished their first year because they're 2021 through 2023 grants. So they just closed out their first year. There were 10 requests that were self-approving. Um, uh, for change budget deviations that add up to 10 uh, more than 10% of the award, but less than 25%, um, staff can review and, and if they find it um, to be reasonable, they can approve it. So there were five requests for, across the, all of these actually were with the HP2 formula. There was only one request on the HP2 competitive grant that, um, that came in at all and it was well under 10%. So most of these numbers are for HP2 formula five of those. And then there was one request HB2 formula that came in um, that was more than 25% of the entire award. So that triggers committee and commission level approval. And so that request was from Inland Empire Latino Lawyers Association. Their three-year HP2 formula award is on the smaller end as far as these awards go. So it's $75,933. The cumulative deviations after one year, and these are both, these are a combination of actual deviations and what they forecast will be different in years two and three. So for the course of the life of the grant, the total deviations actual and expected is $33,821, which is about 44 and a half percent of their award. Um, so I actually, I put in, you can fit it all on the slide, but I'll actually describe to you, and I can put up the spreadsheet if you like, but I'll describe to you what their narrative explanation was. Um, and, and staff's recommendation will eventually be to approve. Chris, I'm sorry to interrupt. I had a problem when looking at this, understanding the column entitled revision amount. Is that mm -hmm. the amount of the grant they are now requesting? Or is that the amount that is to be reduced from the original request? Great question. So, and, and uh, my colleague, Michael, who's in the meeting with us on the fiscal team should feel free to weigh in at any moment because he's he is one who analyzed these percentages. So. The revision amount is the sum of deviations. So let's say, for instance, this is a hypothetical. If they move $10,000 from, sal from attorney salaries to paralegal salaries, and they move $10,000 from rent to um, admin personnel, it would be a $20,000 deviation. So it, you look down their budget and you add up each departure. You can either add up all the negatives or all the positives, because if they net each other out to zero. But if you add up all the positive deviations, that's the revision amount. So that's, they're, they're requesting to revise 44.5% of their budget, which is $33,821, but they still will spend out their full award. Perfect. Will you describe, Chris? Nothing further to add. Thank you. Any questions about that, though? Is that explanation kind of murky? Because I, Michael and I are happy to flush that. That it was fine until the end. Does that mean that this grant is going to be reduced to $42,000? No. So they're still going to spend out. This is actually a good moment, segue for me to talk about like where they're moving the money to. So they're still going to spend out their, they anticipate spending out their entire award. But what they're proposing to do is move $33,821 around in the budget. And what they're specifically, what Ayala is specifically requesting to do is move some of this money from attorney salaries, almost all of it's moving from attorney salaries to other staff salaries in years two and three. So it's staying, they're still gonna spend it, it stays in salaries, but they're in, instead of having attorneys do the work, they have other staff do the work. Um, and their narrative explanation is this, and this, this is my paraphrasing of it. Um, they are traditionally a pro bono focused program. They, they most, their staff mostly, recruits, trains, and supervises pro bono attorneys and law students to provide civil legal aid. When they originally drafted this budget, they anticipated doing something that was sort of unique for them. This is kind of their, the way they, they phrase it. They um, were gonna have an in-house paid staff attorney do this homelessness prevention work. Um, they, they realized that by doing that though, they were putting in jeopardy their um, what they call private attorney involvement revenue that they get as an LSC subgrantee, but also from the state bar for having a pro bono based model, that that was, they're such a small org that, that this change was going to put that in jeopardy. And they wanted to return to their traditional method of delivering legal aid, which was to recruit 
train and supervise pro bonos. Um, so they proposed to just take, keep it in salaries, but move it from staff attorney to other staff. And that's because they'll, they'll leave some in attorneys uh, to do it, you know, in-house attorney supervision of volunteers, but mostly the pro bono coordinator is not an attorney. And that's the person who's going to be doing the recruiting, the training, um, and, and sort of like the admin side of scheduling for the pro bonos with the clients. Um, it's it, the way I would characterize it, having read their narrative is that, and the narrative is in the, um, it's in the spreadsheet that was posted. The way I would characterize it is, is they're, they're returning to their typical delivery mechanism of pro bono. They were gonna to try to do an in-house staff attorney, but they decided to, to not do that after all. So they're gonna spend out the full award, um, but they're just gonna move it from one salary row to a different one. Technically it triggers um, the need to revise. Um, so staff would recommend approval just because it keeps it in salary. They're still gonna spend out, it keeps it in salaries. They don't anticipate a drop in deliverables. They're just gonna have staff recruit, train and supervise pro bono, law students and attorneys to do the work instead of having one in-house staff attorney do all the work. Uh, so I don't mean to rush this one through. So any other questions about this one? Um, there was one thing I wanted to add. Um, it's not relevant to the resolution on the next slide because the resolution is just about Ayala's request. But there was, just to, in case anyone's wondering, in the posted materials, one of the five requests that was between 10% of the award was above 10% but under 25% that staff reviewed, we put in the staff recommendation column, the quote, quote tentative, because their narrative explanation was, was uh, very uh, short and it was for San Diego Volunteer Lawyer Program. So I just wanted to report back that staff has since, since posting the materials, since recommends approval of that, um, uh, and staff has a delegated authority to approve it, but, uh, but I wanted to report back um, the San Diego Volunteer Lawyers Program, um, they, I think their deviation, Michael, I don't know if you have it up in front of you, but I think their deviation was about 14% of their grant. Um, and they had moved about $11,000 or so from um, attorney salaries to benefits and a little bit to non, some of the non-personnel rows like rent. Previously, they had their whole grant sitting in attorney salaries and they kind of had zeros all down like the rest of the budget, more or less. And they had a change in their fiscal team and executive director. They have an interim CFO who's leading the organization right now. And that person um, who took over for the, the previous ED um, is just going through and sort of um, making these budgets a little bit more accurate. She, she believes that at one point, San Diego Volunteer Lawyer Program anticipated other funding would come in and pay for the non-personnel costs and the benefits, but sh she knows that's not gonna happen. So she just wants to make sure the budget is accurate, that it actually accurately reflects the actual benefits cost to the org of this work and some of the non-personnel costs like rent, but they do not anticipate a drop in their deliverables. So if anything, they characterize it more as like a budget correction, um, but no drop in deliverables. I just wanted to flag that in the spreadsheet, it said tentative, but staff has since approved it. And it was only tentative because their narrative explanation was like two sentences before. <laughs> so we made, them, we made them send us more. Okay. Um, any questions about this request? If not, I'll, I'll just go to the next slide, which has a resolution. Um, Dwan, I believe the, um, or, or uh, anyone who sits on the eligibility budget review committee for the IELTA and EAF grants chime in. I believe the, the um, necessary authority is that the committee recommends to the commission that it approve the revision request. So I've phrased the resolution in that way. Um, so it's not that the committee is, it's not that the um, approval stops here, but that the committee will recommend its approval. Yeah, we, we have to, um, we'll, 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 we'll roll it into the, um, the March uh, commission meeting. Okay. Um, I actually have to exit screen share to pull up the voting slip. So I'll um, see if I can, um, I'll uh, pull up the voting slip and then I'll reshare the resolution language so that when you're voting on it, you actually see it in front of you. All right, share. It's not in full screen, but I think. Um, can you see the, the slides? I can't tell if I shared the correct window. 
Okay, so yeah. I'll read the resolution out loud. Um, so should the committee concur with staff's proposal, passage of the following resolution is recommended, resolved that the Legal Services Trust Fund Commission Homelessness Prevention Funds Committee, HB Funds Committee, recommends approving the revised 2021 through 2023 HP formula grant budget, that's the HP2 formula grant budget for Inland Empire Latino Lawyers Association, submitted on October 29th, 2021. Um, Jim, is, I, I don't know if you'd like to call for um, someone to, to move or if you want to continue the discussion, it's totally up to you. Yeah, uh, does anyone have any other comments? If not, I, I move the adoption of the resolution. Second. Uh, was, the, was the second um, Iskin? Yeah. Eric? Great, thank you. Okay, I'll take the vote. Meeker? Yes. Um, Iskin? Yes. Mahoney? Yes. Rhinus? Yes. Uh, Savage? Yes. Schreiber? Yes. And then, Daniel, did you see is, has a uh, Bonache or Amin, a Flaggy or Ulster up joined? I have not, no. Okay, great. Uh, motion carries. Um, all right, thank you. Um, this Jamie brings Kerr us right. to the, this brings us to the recommended changes to the homeless prevention grant report, right? Yes, thank you. All right, so this is the meat of today's meeting, I think. Um, so the uh, we the uh, staff has prepared a few slides on this, and then. We propose, uh, Jim, if you agree, we'll, we'll actually just pull up the, the tables that are in staff's memo for today's meeting so we can actually have them on the screen. And, and we think everyone probably read the tables pretty carefully, but we can go through them row by row sort of efficiently and just that might jog people's memory if they, have, or if they want clarifying questions or something. But um, we have a few slides to kind of tee it up. So let me, um, uh, I'll actually go back to full screen, uh, just make it a little bit bigger for everybody. Okay. Okay, you should see in just a second. Okay, and I'm also gonna invite, um, especially when I'm going through the tables in screen share, I'm especially gonna invite our partners at the Judicial Council to jump in whenever they want because they're, um, uh, sort of they're, they're um, hearing a lot from the State Department of Finance um, as to what the requirements are for the HP3 formula and competitive grants. So they're, they're quite knowledgeable about this. Okay, okay. so the um, recommended updates in staff's memo to the committee would apply to HP2 and or the HP3 grant. So the tables both have columns that specify, actually I think the first table is purely homelessness prevention three formula and competitive updates. And the second table would be both HP2 and HP3. So I just wanted to flag that up front. The tables I think make it really clear what updates apply to which ones, but it is, it is a combination. Um, just to um, get since it may have been a while since folks have thought about the HP2 grants and where they came from and why the requirements might need to be different for HP3, I thought it'd be helpful to just note that the HP, the homelessness prevention two grants um, they live, so to speak, in the government code, uh, government code section 12531, and their origin is in um, litigation settlement funds. The state of California was party to litigation, a case that settled, and the state of California got a portion of the settlement proceeds and used some of it to create the Homelessness Prevention II grant. So it is purely state funding, and it, it derives from the gov a government code section. Um, it does not have any federal reporting requirements, which is why some of these updates don't apply to the HP2 grants. Um, they run for three years, 2021 to 2023. They're one year in um, and have two years left. And um, they uh, currently require annual reports and a final report. They do not have quarterly reports. The HP3 grants, um, they live, so to speak, in the Budget Act, State Budget Act of 2021, um, as opposed to the government code. They do use federal dollars. They use federal coronavirus, what are called coronavirus state fiscal recovery funds. The acronym SFRF pops up again and again and again in the reporting requirements for these. Um, so you'll see those a few places on these slides. 
um, and they have their own state level reporting requirements. So the led state legislature, when, when drafting the Budget Act actually requires certain reports at the state level you know, to the Judicial Council and how the funds were spent. The Department of Finance wants certain reports, but because they're federal dollars, the US Treasury also expects reports. They have a 2021 slash 2022 through 2024 grant period. Um, as a reminder, the HP3 formula funds start on December 1st of 2021. So that's why slash and the uh, HP3 competitive funds start on January 1st of 2022, but they both run through the end of calendar year 2024. Um, they do require, and these requirements are, um, are uh, basically set by the State Department of Finance, which is uh, making sure that the entire state of California can meet its obligations to the US Treasury for reports. So they are requiring quarterly reports, annual reports, and then a, the, the final report. I just put an asterisk here. This asterisk could have lived on the other slide too. And Duan, correct me if this is wrong, but um, the state bar frequently kind of combines the last annual report. You know, they do an annual report for every year with the final report. So usually like the third, so this is a three-year grant, the third year's annual report will just include another section that has all the final report questions. Do you want, does that sound right? Yeah, th that's right, yeah. So they still report on their third year deliverables and spending and everything, but then they have a whole nother set of like, and then reflecting on the entire grant period, how did it go, what did you learn, what went wrong? That kind of thing. Okay, so the reason for updating the HP3 reporting topics. So as you may remember, the Budget Act of 2021 required the commission to administer at least the formula funds, which was the bulk of funding. It was 75% of the total quote, as soon as practicable. So the commission took that, and the committee took that to heart. It launched the, um, the State Budget Act was passed in late July. It launched the formula grant application by mid-August, a matter of weeks later, and the competitive application by September 1, so that um, it could make the formula grant um, allocations by December 1st and the competitive ones by January 1st. Um, so at the time that the applications went live, um, the guidance for programs articulated reporting requirements that were based on the existing framework for HP reporting, which was the HP2 reporting framework. So it had an emphasis on annual reports and the final report. Um, during the fall, so for the, at least for state bar staff, we ended up hearing it about mid-November, I think shortly after November 15th, um, the Department of Finance clarified what the U.S. Treasury and it, the State Department of Finance's reporting requirements were going to be. So it was a couple months later. Um, and the um, staff has since learned that the court, there will need to be quarterly reports that cover spending each quarter. And quote, the, I just copy and pasted this from their guidance, the total number of people served. Um, so not broken out by client, but just like how many cases did you close type reporting. The annual report will cover main benefits. So that does require broken out reporting. So the main benefits are essentially legal outcomes. The term main benefit is part of the California Legal Aid Reporting Handbook. It's a term of art, so we try to stick with it. But essentially, it's outcomes. It, you know, a main benefit code is you preserve their housing. Um, so they could select that as a main benefit code. So that requires individual client level reporting. Um, and we learned that all reports might be due within a few days of the end of the reporting period. Um, yeah, Duan. Yeah, I just wanted to add, um, when we released the reporting requirements, the template to grantees, we did tell them that um, there's going to be more uh, information forthcoming, and some of this guidance may change, and that is in the grant agreement as well. So we're not we're not doing like a bait and switch or anything. They, they know that it's an evolving kind of situation. Thank you for that. Yeah, I remember it was, it was um, we made a point of really heavily emphasizing in the webinars, and I think in the posted guidance, we did say that there would there would probably be quarterly reports, but we didn't know yet what the topics would be because we didn't know yet what the topics would be, but they should prepare for quarterly reports. Um, I think we even said something, if not more frequent or something, which is, thank goodness it's not. And, and Chris, can I also just note that um, Department of Finance is getting um, additional guidance from Treasury continually. <laughs> Um, so, for example, there was a report that was is due on the 31st, and I think they got a request for additional information on the 15th. So um, they're doing the best they can to give us the, the requirements. It's it's um, it's it's quite a, a challenging uh, reporting structure that we have to meet because it's federal money. Yeah, thank you. And and the report that that's due on 
January 31st, we were lucky, our, um, the, our grantees, the State Park Commission grantees were lucky to not have to provide any data for that because we hadn't administered the actual dollars yet. Um, so we were, they were, it was waived for them, but they're gonna have their first quarterly report due probably in April uh, to cover January, February, March. Okay, so in a moment, I'll just pull up the actual table and we can go through it. But um, uh, staff's memo for today's meeting is two tables. So table one updates um, the spirit of the tables is table one promotes compliance for with Department of Finance and US Treasury requirements for HP3. Um, it really is just to like make sure we get DOF and Treasury and that DOF can get Treasury the information it needs on time. Table twos are a little bit, so those, you can almost characterize those as more like quote unquote required updates uh, that other agencies are requiring. Table two is a little bit more strategic. It's trying to shore up the helpfulness and accuracy of the data sets uh, for both HP2 and HP3. So we thought it would be helpful to break it out in that way because table one is like particularly straightforward. Um, uh, specifically table two tries to go about that in three ways. Um, one is it, it attempts to reduce um, main missing main benefit codes. Again, those are legal outcomes. Um, I will provide, okay, we can chat more about this if the um, committee would like to hear more about it, but we, uh, we did notice from the HP1 final report, um, a, a significant percentage of programs left the main benefit code blank, which was allowed because the instruction said, if you can't verify or confirm the legal outcome, leave it blank, don't guess. Don't just say like, well, we hope it saved their housing, but we don't know if it did. Uh, we only wanna know if you, if you can confirm it. And so a lot of programs followed the instructions and left it blank, but what we ended up realizing was um, if they don't select a main benefit code, an outcome, um, we actually don't even know what the area of law was or what the spirit of the intervention was, what it was they were trying to do. We just know that they, they offered um, attorney client like the, the, the matter gave rise to attorney client representation. So the, in the moment, you'll see that we're, our proposal will uh, try to still capture the area of law and the spirit of the intervention, even if they can't confirm it. It also um, contains uh, recommendations to reduce main benefit codes um, for just the HP2 and HP3 reports when the connection to homelessness prevention work is really unclear or maybe just missing. Um, again, from HP1, we did notice that some programs selected main benefit codes that just on its face make it really hard to tell how it was a homeless prevention work. I'm sure if you ask them to explain it in detail, they could probably make a really good argument, but just looking at the data, it sort of looks like they picked um, um, an area of law that, that maybe fell outside the statutory parameters. So it's just gonna attempt to guide them uh, towards statutory compliance on its face. And then it also, the recommendations would also reduce quote unquote other legal resolutions. There's literally a category of legal resolution and legal resolution is like the depth of intervention. Was it counsel and advice? Was it settlement? Was it uh, administrative advocacy? Was it you know, um, representation in court? Um, and there's a category called other, which doesn't um, communicate what the depth of service was, but also most um, uh, legal services fit in one of the existing categories. And so other doesn't really serve um, much of a purpose. So I'll actually go through them row by row, but I just wanted to kind of flag those ones up front. Um, I'm gonna exit this screen share so I can pull up the, the tables. Somebody have any questions though, just while I do that? Okay. And Share my screen again. Chris, I just wanted to add why you're pulling that up on the screen. Uh, to emphasize, this is federal reporting. Um, and, and it may occur uh, in future grants as well. And it, it, when we have to make reports to the United States Congress, it may receive a different uh, review than would have been the case had the reports been submitted only to the California Department of Finance. That's right. I don't know if that, Bonnie, if you have like a, I feel like <laughs> you might have an oh, idea. Yeah. So that's definitely true. <laughs> <laughs> I totally fully agree. And um, I'll just say I'm being asked for backup for every data element. They're, they're very conscious that we will be audited. 
um, on all of these funds. And so we um, want to comply as fully as possible. But yes, it is, it's a whole different level of reporting and a whole different time frame than we would normally get from the state as well. Yeah, with the I I can't remember which meeting it with Department of Finance it was, but I, in one of the meetings they just said it really bluntly. They were they just said California is getting way more money than any other state in the country in coronavirus state fiscal recovery funds, and um, uh, that if the reporting um, uh, data doesn't isn't consistent, it doesn't add up. You know, if quarters that should match aren't matching, if the data is missing, that kind of thing. Um, DOF's perspective on it is. Congress just won't give California as much money next time. So that's how they kind of explained it to us is why it was super important. Is this too big or is it, I can never tell if with other people. Okay, good. <laughs> to me, it looks really big, but the, um, okay. So this is table one. Um, it's the recommended changes. I almost use the word required changes because like from DOF's perspectives, like some of these are required, but I, did, I think I have one in here that is truly just recommended. It's like the first row. So I said recommended changes for HB3. So um, the I'll, I'll, I'll preface this presentation with there's two attachments to the memo. Both attachments use red lines um, just to show you what these changes would look like in written guidance to programs. I just want to be really clear, and Donna Hershkowitz was wanted me to be really clear with you that that like the the request for proposals is a historical document. It lives at a particular point in time. We're not amending the RFP. The RFP is done. Programs applied for that funding and they got it or they didn't get it. But the attachments are just to be um, just to illustrate for you how the written guidance would look. We'll probably unless you um, you have amendments. We'll probably like take those attachments and post them on Smart Simple. It's just like the updated guidance, but we're not actually going back in time and amending like the RFP or something. It'll just be like, here's the new updated guidance. Okay. So one of the updates um, is uh, just noting, and I'm just going to kind of focus on the center column here. Um, it's just noting that HP three reporting topics is to put programs on notice that the topics and deadlines are subject to state and federal requirements for the coronavirus state fiscal recovery funds. Um, which might change over time um, and that they should, this isn't like the other grants, the commission ministers where it's kind of just set up front and then never changes. Um, and so we just put in here on the rationale column that staff does not actually anticipate um, that anything in particular will change, but we know over the course of three years, we might hear at least once DOF tell us, actually, we need you to add this other question to your quarterly reports. Okay, so that's just kind of, it's like an easy one. We're just gonna notice that to them. Um, okay, so the, um, currently, so this is, um, I'm just gonna see if I can maybe highlight it in a meaningful way. So I'm looking here. So currently the HP3 formula and competitive grant uh, language for reporting specify that uh, programs will have to submit quarterly spending reports um, that compare spending to the approved budget. Um, so the change would be that grantees will have to submit quarterly spending reports um, and that the spending will also have to break out uh, those reports will often break out any spending on full scope representation and eviction proceedings. Um, that is not currently in the guidance. That is, to my knowledge, a requirement that the of the Department of Finance, and that's because one of the um, emphases for the coronavirus state fiscal recovery funds was investments in quote evidence based interventions. And so the U.S. Treasury is asking each state to report how much of that spending was on interventions where there's a basis and evidence for its efficacy. So DOF asked us, well, for homeless prevention legal aid, what interventions are those? And we identified a body of evidence um, in full scope representation and unlawful detainer proceedings. And so Department of Finance said, great, we want that broken out. Bonnie, did I characterize that accurately or is there a nuance that I missed? Sorry. Okay, sure. So that's not in the guidance. So we're, that the quarterly responding reports are gonna have to have a question about that. Um, this one of those things where staff usually would work with programs to figure out, and the Department of Finance has articulated it's, it's okay with this, to figure out like what is the most accurate but efficient way for programs to do that. So we would provide technical assistance. We sort of um, forecasted for the Department of Finance up front that probably programs will either just track it separately altogether, like they'll have different staff doing full scope representation level detainer proceedings, and it'll be very easy for them to pull that spending, or they'll have the same staff doing some uh, full scope rep and unlawful team proceedings, but then some other work and that they will use 
the percent of total project staffing, like FTE, full-time equivalent staffing, to just to figure out how much of the spending, what percentage of it was on evidence-based interventions versus interventions where there's not yet a basis in evidence, um, that the evidence hasn't been compiled and the Department of Finance said that that was gonna be okay. Okay. Um, and the third one, and this is sort of the, these, the first two are kind of modest, I suppose, but this one's a little bit uh, more significant. So the HP3, and I'm looking here, the HP3 formula grant guidelines specify, um, these were the ones that the, the formula grant application went launched on August 16th. It was like the earliest, the earlier of the two. So the guidance was really preliminary and it specified regular reports because we didn't know if it was gonna be quarterly or like semi-annual on client level data on demographics the benefits, economic benefits, et cetera, the, the normal metrics that we collect. Um, and then for the competitive grants, we by then we knew it was probably gonna be quarterly, but we weren't sure if it was just gonna be spending or total client served. So we said quarterly reports on everything. We've since learned um, that for both grants, DF is gonna need quarterly reports on spending and which is up above, and then um, total number of persons served. That's just like, it's like the language they use. Um, which, um, and we've checked this with them, can be, so as opposed to completely broken out client level data with each client's race, ethnicity, gender identity, counties of code, et cetera, they just need for the quarterly reports, total number of persons served, and that can be total cases closed if there was attorney client representation. And since those cases can bridge quarters, they would, you would just count it when it closed. Um, and then for what we traditionally call quote, other services, which would be matters where there's no attorney client representation, but maybe it's a know your rights training or a hotline call where the provider doesn't open a file for that, that client um, or a self-help clinic or something like that. Um, it would just be the number of participants, the number of recipients of those services in that quarter, but there's no, there's no case to close. Um, so it would be total cases closed and then all of those other services beneficiaries. Um, the change here, the big change is it would be um, taking the client level data, the race, ethnicity, gender identity, veteran status, et cetera, and, and saving it for the annual report instead of doing it on a quarterly basis. And the reason we think that's going to be necessary for programs is we've learned that the Department of Finance um, is expecting that Treasury is going to require the grantees to provide this data in about four or five calendar days of the close of each quarter. So for like January, February, and March of 2022, they're going to have to send us their spending and total number of persons served by say April 4th or 5th. And that's inclusive of holidays and weekend days. The state bar is going to have to turn that around and get it to the judicial council by April 8th. So we have a week to do all that. And we, we believe that since it's not actually required that they break out all the demographics, in the zip counties and the zip codes for the quarterly reports that we not require that since they're only gonna have a couple of days to do it, most likely. Dwan or Bonnie, is there anything to say? I just wanna say, th this is a really tight time schedule, but we de obviously wanna be in compliance because usually we give programs about a month at least to re submit any of our reports. That's kind of like our standard and programs are used to that. So we've given programs a heads up, but you know, once you all, if you approve this, we'll we'll definitely have a webinar and 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 make it really clear because this this is really really tight um, in terms of it, that's calendar days, not business days for programs to, to submit this um, this information. Hi, Tammy. Okay. Yeah. I didn't know if you said my name. Um, so the reporting on this, though, you said it would be annual, correct? And, and then do we expect the same tight deadline at after year end, probably most likely? So is there any concern that, or would we be, have a way to ensure that they're actually capturing this information throughout the year because that tight deadline's not gonna go away. And if you're trying to compile a year versus a quarter, it's gonna be a little more complicated. Right, if they're not getting any more time at the annual reporting deadline, this is helpful. <laughs> Um, so it's, I really encourage like Dwan and Bonnie to hop in, but the, um, the, and we're in constant conversation, the, the state bar is a constant conversation with the Judicial Council about how to like navigate the, the, the more broken out rigorous annual reports. Um, so, you know, I, what we're currently thinking about doing is having, um, providing lots of technical assistance to help grantees try and keep track of this data on a monthly basis. 
um, such that by the time they get to the annual reporting deadline, they had their they can do a simple export from their case management system through so that the Department of Finance has already told us that they want the annual report to be um, July 1 through June 30th of every year. So um, so that by the time they get to um, like say July, like fifth, sixth or seventh or something that they can report really rigorous data through at least June 21st or something like as close as they can get to June 30th. Um, and that we'll just have to be really hands-on with them to make sure that they're, they're entering it contemporaneously and they're like ready to export it and it's ready to go. And they use a form that we can, Save Our can just take it, synthesize it for all the grantees really quickly and pass it along. I don't know if, um, it definitely is um, causing staff some amount of anxiety though, trying to make sure they figure out how that's gonna work. So Duan or Bonnie, I don't know if you have any thoughts on it. I mean, we're, we're, we're brainstorming kind of scenarios to make sure that the numbers on the quarterly reports actually at, match up to the annual report. Um, so we bounced out around a couple ideas. Bonnie's been the point person in, in contact with the Department of Finance to see, you know, what if they don't match? Is there a mechanism for us to correct it? Because sometimes um, we foresee a situation that maybe um, they submit their quarterly report and then they go submit their annual and there was just kind of a mistake. Um, so then are we stuck with that or can we go back and and and, um, and correct that? And if we, we can't go back and correct it, then yeah, what Chris said, one option is to do maybe a monthly and, and try to reconcile to make sure at least they're submitting it and we have 11 of the 12 months. So the, we're, we're playing around with a lot of scenarios and we're getting more guidance from um, DOF. So it is, um, it, it's evolving. <laughs> we're getting there, but but it's not quite, we don't have, we, we don't have all the answers for you, but um Bonnie, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I'll also say we're asking if we can report a quarter in arrears, which would give us, I think would be the best solution, but boy, it's, you know, there again, this is where DOF is trying to, you know, figure out what treasury will allow and that sort of thing. But I will say, Tammy, that our, um, our data people would be much happier <laughs> if they had quarterly reports and we were kind of, you know, being able to monitor and support as things went along. Yeah. But we're also mindful it's, you know, of the of the challenges on the programs. Yeah, but thank you. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. No, I just said thank you. I do appreciate the responses and and the challenge. You know? Yeah, the last thing I'll say, and I, and I don't want to put too much weight on this because we've just started exploring it and we might not, there may be issues with this direction, but um, for the annual report, we know that the Department of Finance needs the main benefits. They need to know how many housing, uh, how many people's housing did you save versus how many and habitability, uh, instances of habitability did you improve? Like they want it broken out. But they don't necessarily need at that moment at the annual report deadline for DOF to get back to the US Treasury. They don't need necessarily the demographics and the geographies and the zip codes and everything. They do want that eventually. So we're also exploring the option of like a bifurcated annual report, like a phase one, phase two, like first just get us your total main benefits in each of these categories. This is what we need to get to do at FACP. And then now we have a little more time. You can break it out by client and you can let us know what their identity, you know, gender identities. We're exploring it. That's like a very, very early. And that would, like I said, that would be like, if we couldn't get a quarter reporting one quarter in arrears. Okay. That's the end of table three. It's kind of short and sweet. It's pure, we really wanted to just break it out to be like this, this is really facilitates just DOF reporting. And then the, the remainder is kind of more like what we, we um, like lessons we're learning from the HP one final report, which isn't public yet. And, and we're still like um, preparing that report, but we've, we've started looking at the data. Uh, so I guess before I just launch into table two, is there any lingering questions or thoughts about table one? Okay. Um, okay, so the, the remainder of the recommendations would apply to both HP2 and HP3 and the spirit of all of them isn't DOF reporting compliance or anything or treasury reporting compliance. It's purely how to make sure the data set is as rigorous as possible so that uh, when the, um, the US Treasury or members of Congress or the state legislature or members of the public look at the reports because we have to file reports for all of these grants. Um, it's really clear that grantees use the dollars on statutorily compliant work and that the, the data is as um, supportive of possible like future funding for homelessness prevention and delay. Okay. 
Um, so for the first row, um, the existing HP2 and HP3 guidance uh, requires reporting the main benefits, which again, I'll just keep saying is outcomes, a quote, according to the codes and definitions in the California Legal Aid Reporting Handbook. Um, so the proposal is, this is a close consultation with the Judicial Council after looking at the HP1 final report data, is to, for the HP grants specifically, none of the other grants, the commission ministers, but for the HP ones to limit the main benefit codes, the outcome codes, to just those that comply with the statutory parameters for HP funding. So you remember that really long list of like, it can be eviction defense and foreclosure prevention and um, uh, work with domestic violence survivors who would otherwise experience housing displacement and that sort of thing. The codes that correlate to that. Um, and it, it can be kind of like a generous sort of interpretation, but there, but there, there are simply main benefit codes that are just about different areas of law. Um, and um, staff would work really closely with the Judicial Council to try and pull that list and allow programs to try and make a case for any main benefit code that isn't, doesn't appear on the list. Like they're like, actually, I think that is homelessness prevention work that's within the, the parameters of the statute and it should be included. There'd be a mechanism for staff to collect that input from programs. But to remove, otherwise to remove what we're calling ext extraneous um, outcome codes like um, so, you know, there's, there may be like education law or immigration law outcome codes and the like that just aren't going to be relevant. We did observe as we're sorting through the HP1 final report data, we have observed that some programs did pick codes that on their face look like it falls outside the scope of the statute. They might be able to make a really good argument for how it's homelessness prevention work, but our worry is that in the... Um, in the, uh, what our worry is like one, maybe they can't and then make that argument or two, even if they can, that a, a reader of the report will think they did statutorily unauthorized, unauthorized um, activities under the statute. We've just done a first pass of all the, there's 109 or so main benefits codes. We're not ready to publish them yet because we've just looked at it once, but we, were, we identified at least 50 that were more or less clearly within the scope of the statute. So we know there's like a, at least a list of 50 and where if anything, we would be, very careful to um, to um, allow some codes in the list that we're not totally sure are homelessness prevention work, but maybe it is. We'd let it in. You know, we wouldn't we wouldn't be too stingy with it. Right, I'm just yeah, pausing. I'll, I'll just say I, I think that might be easier for the programs at any rate to have a shorter list rather than the long list. And um, while I have every confidence that programs use the funds as was you know set forth in the grant, um, I'm concern that a federal auditor might not be as convinced and might ask more questions. And I just don't want to put any program in a position of having to, you know, track down and figure out why they coded something, particularly if it was just an error. So um, that's the hope. Make it easier for everybody. Um, and we thought about like providing a list and a footnote for this memo, um, but we, we realized there really does need to be a moment where we touch base with programs. Like, in a, we, we always do a reporting webinar, like how, to, how the reports will unfold and what changes you can expect. And we need to, ch to check in with them about like what we're thinking, codes we're thinking about using. Um, and we worry that by putting it in the memo, it's going to look like we had settled on a list already. Um, okay. So the next one um, is. Uh, the sort of existing authority, so to speak, is is something from the California Legal Aid Reporting Handbook. This isn't in the written reporting requirements for HP2 and HP3 specifically, but um, the handbook says um, that uh, grantees should report main and economic benefits for both limited and extended services if you can confirm, I should have like bolded the confirm, the benefit was achieved. So the change would be, and this is when we were looking at the HP1 data, um, we saw, and then we checked in with programs and they confirmed that a lot of them left the main benefits codes blank as the instruction said they should, if they couldn't confirm it, because they couldn't confirm it. They didn't know for sure that the outcome had been secured. And so, um, and that happened really often in counsel and advice cases where the provider provided um, advice for someone who's going through an eviction but uh, it was just like a, it was like a 45 minute phone call. The person never came back. They don't actually know for sure that the eviction was prevented. So they would just leave it blank. But the consequence of that is you actually they don't, other than the, uh, selecting a main benefit code is actually where they tell you what the area of law was and what the goal was. So if they don't select a main benefits code, all you know is that it was counsel and advice or rep, you know limited scope representation or a brief service or something. So to get around that, um, to fix that for HP2 and HP3, the proposal is 
require programs to select a main benefit code no matter what, just to capture what the goal is. So we know the area of law and what the client wanted to achieve. Um, and then it, it is an extra step for them, but we don't think it's too cumbersome. It's just have them select, is the outcome anticipated or is it verified? Um, so at least we'll know what, that the, the work was complied with the statute, that it was housing, because the statute allows housing and income maintenance, public benefits work, and some some family law work that you know we can know like which of those boxes it fit in and the like. I'm just going to kind of keep scrolling, but, but um, if I'm going too fast, um, people need a moment to think. If they have questions, just stop me. Um, I don't mean to make this feel rushed. I'll try and also scroll just so that the most recent one sort of sits at the top. So I'm on this one now. Um, OK, so this is a really, I think, really straightforward one. It's kind of funny that actually it hasn't been addressed yet. But um, the, well, I suppose the reason it hasn't, this one hasn't been addressed is because normally for annual main benefits reporting, there, um, it's like, it's an annual thing. Programs do it for all of their grants. If something doesn't, if a case doesn't close by the end of the reporting cycle, it'll just get captured in the next year's report because normal main benefits reporting just happens every single year. So something that is necessary for these one-time grants, like technically HP2 is a one-time grant, HP3 is a one-time grant. What this is saying is um, the California Legal Aid Reporting Handbook says, just report it if the case is closed. Well, for these one-time grants, um, if the case is still open and it's the end of the grant period, it's the end of year three, they've spent HP2 or HP3 dollars on it, but the case is still open. And this is often true for impact litigation cases. They should take that moment in the final report to report on it as though it had closed. Like they should, you know, they should still report it and not, and not, not report it. And we got a lot of feedback from the HP1 final report that there was, which was a one-time grant, that there was just like, full, there was um, impact litigation that was still open and, and programs were like, do we report it? And we ended up having to provide the technical assistance that they that they should um, report it, even if it was like, you know, hadn't quite closed yet, if they had worked on it the entire grant period, because we didn't want it to lose that work. So this is just, this would go in the written guidance to programs for their final, um, their final report in the third year. Okay. Um, so the California Legal Aid Reporting Handbook states, um, and I added the, the brackets. Um, the second, which um, in the report is, is other services, section of the report. And this is the section of the report that um, is about self-help clinics, know your rights trainings, et cetera, where attorney client representation does not arise. So it could, it's a quick touch point. It might be legal information only, or the person's a pro per client, so they represent themselves. So for these, quote, other services, um, the handbook says um, it collects information on all other non-case services, no attorney client representation by area of law. So the lists of areas of law um, correlate generally to all the main benefits codes. So if we're removing the extraneous main benefit codes so that areas of law that don't fall within the scope of the statute don't appear, we would propose to also remove those areas of law from the quote other services section. So they wouldn't, they would be discouraged. They wouldn't be able to pick an option that says, we did know your rights trainings in immigration law or education law. I'm making this up. We haven't actually configured the list yet and we would check in with programs about it. But if there's an area of law that just falls outside the scope of the statute, it would it currently appears, but it wouldn't appear. So they would be encouraged to put it in like housing or income maintenance or something like that. Uh, I'm just going ahead and see, this is the last one. Um, and this is actually a, um, I thought it was just worth noting, this is actually a practice that's not a written policy. So it's the only one in the table that is just a practice and, and technically might not even require committee or commission ap approval, um, but I wasn't sure. So we stuck it in just to be safe. Um, so the practice is, because this isn't in the main, this isn't in the California Legal Aid Reporting Handbook, is to allow grantees to report legal resolutions and legal resolutions refers to the depth of intervention. So it's, um, it's like counsel and advice is the lowest depth of intervention they can pick. And then full scope representation in a court case as opposed to an administrative law case is the highest level I think they can pick. And then there's a bunch in between. So the practice is to let them report a legal resolution in the following categories and then I list them. The last one is other. We noticed a surprising number of HP1 grantees in the final report select other. Um, and this, the other category is just, it's been the practice for a long time to include an other option, but the, 
what staff at the State Bar have observed and what the Judicial Council has observed, and I don't mean to speak for your team, Bonnie, but just correct me if this is wrong, is that there, it, just about any level of intervention can fairly fit in one of the other categories, ranging from counsel and advice all the way up through full scope representation in a court proceeding. Um, and it, we can simply modify the instructions to ask them to pick the best one, the one that best fits, but allowing them to pick other in the, in the report makes it really unclear what they did because they didn't feel like they could fairly characterize it even as counsel and advice or any other kind of depth of, inter, of representation. And it makes the data sit in a sort of like other bucket that makes it really hard to know what they actually did. Was it a lot of service or was it very, very little? So just to remove other and ask them to pick the best option from the remaining ones. Um, and that's it. Those are all of the, we tried to keep the recommended updates to a minimum. We tried not to get too carried away. So table one is really just like what we think is necessary to meet DOF expectations. And table two is, is kind of like hard lessons learned or important lessons learned from the HP1 final report, which is forthcoming, but we're, we've, we've had um, lots of time to sift through the data at this point. Um, I'll leave this up. Um, this is the last really like substantive topic on the agenda. There's, there's one more item that's kind of an open-ended discussion item, but this is the, the last thing we'll be asking the committee to vote on. How would the vote look, Chris? You want us to uh, approve a resolution that approves all of the changes that have been recommended on the chart? Great question. Let me actually just, I'll switch back to the slides and, um, and we might actually want to wordsmith the, the, um, the resolutions a bit. So let me um, just, I'll just put it up now. And I did, you'll see it in a moment. I did uh, try to squeeze everything on one slide, so it, I apologize. It's a little bit dense, but um, <laughs> if you want, I can break it up onto two slides. Let's see. Um, okay, so um, you should be seeing the slide now. So the, um, I did add um, one thing in yellow highlight that was not in the recommended resolution that was in the memo for today. And then there's another thing that, um, Jim wanted to flag for the group. Um, I'll, I'll just kind of start um, with the one that's already there. So um, thank you to Kim Savage for pointing out an error. So um, I'll read the top part of the resolution and then I'll explain in its entirety and I'll explain the yellow language. So um, resolved that the Legal Services Trust Fund Commission Homelessness Prevention HP Funds Committee recommends the changes to 2021 through 2023 HP, which is HP2, grant reporting and 2021 slash 2022 through 2024 HP, which is HP3 grant reporting as described in staff's January 28th, 2022 memo with the following correction. Language about budget variances, for example, in attachment A, will specify that grantees must report deviations that exceed that exceed 10% of the award rather than deviations, quote, of 10% or more of the award. So that's just the top part. So, so Kim noticed in attachment A, and, and I kind of worded the correction. So if it appeared anywhere else, we could fix it there too. That um, attachment A, at least, which is for HP3, and this was actually in the RFP, um, it actually said, you have to report budget variances that of 10% or more of the award, but the general grant provisions for the trust fund program do state it's variations that exceed 10%. So if somebody had a variation that was exactly 10%, whatever that means mathematically, like rounding, it was 10%, um, it would make a difference for them. To, uh, under the general uh, grant provisions, they should not have to report that. Um, so this would correct that. Um, and, then, um, and then Jim has a recommendation for the further results. So I'm just gonna read it as it appeared in the memo. Further resolved, the committee recommends delegating to state bar staff the authority to update HP3 reporting topics. So just this is just HP3, it's not HP2. And deadlines when necessary to comply with state and federal requirements for coronavirus state fiscal recovery funds. Um, and, and Jim, I'll just turn it over to you for your, your question to the group. Yeah, I, I, had, no, I had no problems at all with the, the, the first part, the result, and thank Kim for her eagle eyes. It's the second part, I had the same problem as I had with the minutes in that if so you had an independent, especially an independent hostile review of this. It looks like we're completely delegating to staff. And I would rather have, and actually we didn't come up with the proposed language, but something like 
And again, I have no interest whatsoever to micromanage staff. I have complete confidence in them. But something along the lines that maybe says major substantive changes will be done with or in consultation with the chair. So it still shows that if there's going to be a major change, that the committee is involved. And the only hypothetical I can think of is if, say, the Department of Finance says, you know, we're not interested in client zip codes because we're not interested in rural issues uh and we you don't think we don't think you should report that well we would want that collected because other people were accountable for like the state legislature has said that they are interested in rural services so even if the department of finance is not interested we as a commission still are so again i'm not worried about how staff is actually going to do this and i'm and i'm and i'm sensitive to the issue that some of these reporting changes in terms of days or days of the week or what time it has to be in, has to be done quickly and efficiently. Uh, I still am concerned about the appearance that we're completely delegating all issues as it's worded now. Uh, Taylor. Would that raise any questions, Jim, you made reference to the term, you know, substantial changes or, you know, major changes um, without that being defined anywhere? Does that still? Well, yeah, I mean, I originally thought uh, changes would be made in consultation with the chair, but I could see how that would be read as micromanaging. And even though as an emeriti, I've got lots of free time and I'm available 24 seven to staff, I think it does give the appearance of, of micromanaging. And I don't mind if, if we just use something like major substantive changes, because I am sure Chris would come to me if they said, hey, they want us to drop zip codes. What do you think? They, I mean, they wouldn't do that without talking to me about it. Um, so I'm just, you again, this that. is- that is true. Yeah, yeah. I, I, it's one of those things where it's like, you know, we, it's one of those things in practice, we actually love working with Jim. So it's like every meeting is a pleasure and he's such a, like a good thought partner. It's like kind of not an issue. I should flag that. Um, uh, and, and Kim and Dwan and Jim weigh in if you don't agree, but um, I think that each, the, uh, sorry, the Partnership Grants Committee might be following on the foot, the heels of the HP committee and might adopt something similar. And they're gonna look to see what the HP funds committee does here. And it might, what we do here might set a precedent for them. And I just want to flag that. Um, I think I cut Jim off on accident. And then, and then maybe after that, Dwan has her hand up. No, well, I just responding, Tammy. I, I think major substantive changes would would be clear enough that it would it would survive scrutiny by an outside reviewer. And then Dwan. Um, yeah, I just want to say, you know, we're really so fortunate to have um, Jim be the chair of this committee, and Jim has been so helpful. You know, we have weekly calls with the judicial council, and Jim is on almost every single one of them to kind of. Um, consult with and you know provide his advice my, my my only concern though is that it does set a little bit of a precedence in that other chairs may have to follow um and it is a very quickly moving um in terms of the guidance that we get from dof i mean we got an email last night at 6 30 pretty much saying we had to respond right um, right away bonnie's smiling because yeah and then i had to then rally up the troops um to get a response and get them something at 9 a.m um, today and 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 I know you're so gracious with your time, Jim. I just my hesitation is to set that precedent for the next chair that comes or the another committee that will feel like they they have that. And the thing is to follow and, and kind of that that like very high bar. Um, and the the thing is, you know, we we are like Chris and I are not um, doing this in a vacuum. Um, we meet weekly with judicial counsel um, and their staff, and so there is a lot, a lot, a lot of oversight. And Jim, you know, you, you're involved every step of the way. It's just my hesitation is actually putting in a motion where then um, maybe another another committee feels like they have to follow that. Um, but but obviously, Chris and I defer to the new committee. I will just say that, um, and, 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 and Jim, um, what, what I heard you saying is you're, you're concerned about like, uh, I don't want the word optics is like way overused, but essentially like what will someone else think when they see it and the conclusions will they come to about the integrity of the process and the judgment of the committee and that sort of thing. So this, what I'm about to say does not, is not meant to actually undermine the point, but um, I'll just for context say, 
what staff's in, intention was with this was especially if um, DOF added something. So the, the way we tried to word it was we wouldn't take anything away from the reporting requirements because it would be limited. The delegation of authority, whether it was in consultation with the committee chair or not, would be limited to whatever is strictly necessary to comply with requirements. And so if DOF were to like remove a requirement, it wouldn't be necessary for compliance that we also remove it because you can ask them for more data than is necessary. But if DOF were to add something, staff could then just add it really quickly without having to come back to the committee. I just wanna provide that as context. Well, again, I'm not saying it comes back to the entire committee. I would say we come to the chair and if the chair thinks this is a major issue that the committee needs to talk about, then that would be raised with the committee. Um, but I don't know. Again, I may be oversensitive to that appendix I review. I've never gone through anything like that before. And I don't know if we had something again, if uh, we'd be subject to scrutiny, outside scrutiny by such a hostile consultant. Uh, I'd be interested in Rich's opinion and Chris's opinion on that. Well, I dare say that those days are behind us, but I do think that given the committee's, the commission's newfound independence, we are probably insulated to some extent from a future surprise. I wish I were as sanguine. I, uh, <laughs> I, I've just been around too long. And the, the pendulum swings too frequently. Jim's sensitivity uh, strikes a resonant chord with me. Um, but I, I think that the, the concern that Juan raised about the setting a high bar is okay. If you're gonna uh, take on the, the role, uh, you ought to take on the responsibility. I'd also like to just say you're welcome to, to Jim for uh, leaving you small shoes to fill. <laughs> <laughs> and I saw Kim Savage had her hand up. I don't know if you if you lowered it on purpose or if you wanted to jump in. Um, well, I, Jim and I had a com conversation about this and, and I think that this is sufficiently narrowly um, articulated to, um, to basically car, you know, car, carve out the roles well. I mean, I, I think that if you step back and look at what the commission is doing and what the HP committee is doing, particularly with the um, greater specificity in the minutes that I think we've agreed to, um, I, I, I'm not concerned that this is viewed as delegating too much to staff and the commission not being sufficiently involved. So I'm, I'm comfortable with what's on the screen. Just, just as a quick response, the thing that got me was the authority to further update HP3 reporting topics. It's the reporting topics that mm. I was concerned about because what if they're not interested in the rural issues? Well, a reporting topic is a zip code of clients. Um, and I just think there ought to be some consultation if it's a major, and I would consider that a major substantive change. Uh, the issue of deadlines, I fully appreciate uh, Duan's concerns. Um, and having been involved with those weekly meetings, I'm glad I'm not involved with the daily meetings. Uh, and I think they need a fast response time on that. But reporting topics, I think, is a much broader issue for me and may um, not be for the rest of the committee. Well, I, was, I just wanted to offer an alternative that I'm not even necessarily going to push for. I'm just going to throw it out there. We could say, because this is this was also be consistent with what staff had in their head when they were writing it. The committee recommends delegating to state bar staff the authority to add uh, instead of update to add HP3 reporting topics and adjust deadlines when necessary to comply with state. So that wouldn't take anything away. Duan, I don't know if I'm overstepping, and you're like, no, 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 that's not that's not what we that won't work. But <laughs> it's just like yeah, well, we. We, we don't actually, when we add, we don't add very lightly. We add really in consultation with you all and with our programs. Like we don't just haphazardly add. There's a lot of, lot of processes in order for us to like make a change to our uh, reporting handbook. So yeah, if, if that helps um, ease your um, hesitation, then I, that, that's what we meant. But um, 
again, this is just, it's really technicality. I don't really see it as a big issue. So if you all feel really strongly that we need to add the consultation with the chair, we will. I, I'm just, you know, I, I come to all these meetings just to make sure the consistency from one, from one grant program to the next, it's being treated the same. And so, um, and the committee definitely should like um, listen to its heart and, and make the decision that it think that it thinks is right. And this is just a procedural technicality: is that the um, the commission has has only delegated a, the authority to like um, certain authorities with scoring with respect to scoring and grant making at this point. The committee, so that the commission, to my knowledge, has retained the authority to set the reporting requirements. So the way this is worded is we'll recommend that this be the case and the commission will have to take this up. But you obviously wanna make sure you're recommending something you believe in, so. Well, I'm interested in Eric's opinion since if this language might uh, boil over into the partnerships grant, what do you think? We still have Eric? Actually, sorry, Jim, I was I was uh, diverted onto something else. So I, I can't really answer the question. Um, so just you uh, want to so restate it, Jim? Sorry, Bonnie, what you want me oh, to I restate just said, it? Did you want to restate the question for Eric? I oh, uh, that, that as, as Duan said, this might uh, boil over to other committees and since the most logical next one would be um, the Partnerships Grants Committee, would, would he be concerned about having language that says major substantive changes will be done with consultation with the chair since he's chair of that committee? I don't have any concerns about that. So, um... Uh, uh, Jim or anybody else, if you want to make a motion, um, you're welcome to, to, anyone's welcome to move to adopt it as written or as amended and, and then can state the how they would like it to be phrased differently. And then we could take a vote. We can vote yes or no to have they like the amendment. Well, how, how about we do it a two-stage process? First to approve as it's written now, and then a second vote to see if people want to amend the last sentence to include major substantive changes with, with consultation with the chair. How about that? That, that also works. You can do that. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, so I, I move. We have a second. All right. Uh, Rhina seconds. Great. And I'll take the vote. Uh, Meeker. Oh, uh, yes. Um, Iskin? Yes. Uh, Mahoney? Yes. Rhinus? Yes. Savage? Yes. And Shriver? Yeah. Um, so, so the motion carries. So I, I just want to think like rules of order. So, so um, and make sure we're capturing everyone's intention. So, so the, the, um, the motion uh, is, or the, the proposal is to, Jim, you want to take two votes. Now you want to do it again. I'm just thinking if like everyone votes yes on the amended version, we have a conflict and they'll have to, we'll have to take a third vote to figure out which one they want. Or is it your intention to stop after the first vote and say people seem to be comfortable with this one, we'll just stick with it. No, I thought I was going to make a motion to amend the wording of the further resolve to add the proposed sentence. Okay. And if and if people, if that doesn't pass, then it doesn't change. If it does pass, then we would add that sentence. Okay, so, so um, yeah, I, I think I understand. So we'll take another, another vote. Kim um, has her hand up though. I, I'm a little confused by this process because it appeared to me that people supported um, as written on, on the screen. So, um, I, I think I'm a I think, little confused. I, yeah. I also wasn't sure if Eric responded to a change, but Eric didn't <laughs> comment on whether he was fine with what was put up on the screen. I, I'm fine. Yeah. And so I think, Kim, you, you touched a good point that kind of occurred to me as I was taking the vote. It was like, that was, a, that was a formal vote. And by the way, we can always retake the vote if people are like, oh, that's what we were voting on. Like, we need to make sure people understand what they're voting on. But um, 
that was a that motion carried and that was to pass it as written so does anybody we can retake it but like jim for instance if you actually think that um it would be your preference to amend it like would you have wanted to vote no in that last round um well yeah yeah because i thought <laughs> i thought what we were going to do was first look at the, at the current wording and then second go to whether or not we should add an amendment to the further resolve section yeah, so I think. Okay, I mean, I guess maybe I, I'm not a parliamentarian. Maybe I should have split it. Yeah, no, that's we should okay. have Voted yeah. on the resolve, and then we should have voted on the further resolve. So. Um, oh, great! Yeah, so this is great. I mean, we can we will just retake the vote, but we'll just be like extra clear this time. So the um, the the motion um, I think is when it whenever we have further resolve, do you take them together? You can split them into two resolutions that's also allowed and take two votes, but normally they, they, they come as a package. So it'd be for both. Um, and, and Jim, are you moving? Would you, um, would you, as the person who made the motion, would you prefer to, to move as amended and to add the phrasing um, in consultation with the committee chair? And I'll, I, can, I'll write, I would actually write this into the slides so people could see it and the further resolved. Um, and take that vote? Or do you want the first vote to just be as written? Because if it passes, I think Kim's point is if it passes, then it's, the question is done. Because it yeah. will pass. Yeah, it, it will has pass. passed. <laughs> yeah. So um, you know, there's, there's a moment where I think people were confused about what they were voting on. So you can like, we can like clarify it and retake the vote, but. Chris, it, the way the further resolve would read would be the committee recommends delegating to the state bar staff in consultation with the chair as to um, uh, major items or material or significant items and so on? Uh, well, actually, I'll just put it, I'll type it in now with a different color. Uh, I'm gonna unhighlight this because this doesn't seem like um, something people need to change at this point. But um, delegating to state bar staff and, and it's whoever's making the motion. So, because um, would be that person would be moving to, to pass it as amended and the amendment would be State bar staff, what I heard was in consultation with the committee chair. Um, and I did miss sort of the part about substantial changes. You know, I just, I think if you just leave it that way, you can, uh, it's satisfactory to me. So, and so, so Jim, I think it's uh, from a, a rules of order perspective, if it, whatever motion we take now, if it passes, that'll be the, the decision that the committee, assuming everyone knows, you know, knows what they're voting on, that will be the decision the committee makes. Um, and since you were the one to make the motion, um, you know, you're, you're welcome to like remake the motion as amended. And I see Tammy has raised your hand. I think as written though, it almost suggests that all changes. And I think we're trying to avoid are trying to give, you know, delegate the authority to the state bar to make non-major right. substantive changes. Yeah. yeah, that's that's why my my idea was to add a sentence, not put in the middle of it, but to add a sentence at the end. Major substantive changes will be done in cons with consultation of the chair. Can, is there disagreement about that particular piece about the addition? Yes. Yes. There is. So yes. my my view would be if we don't do a further resolved, let's do two votes. Let's break it up. Let's get the one passed and then let's address the second one separately. Does anybody have an objection to that? Well, the first one has passed. <laughs> I mean, well, we already we took passed it with We passed it with the second part though. And I think there's some dispute on the second part. So it seems like that vote, um, th there was some confusion about what that vote meant. Yeah, I, I, I agree with the, that last point. I think that um, that Jim who made the motion and staff failed to catch in time that the motion wasn't actually what he was intending. I don't think that the outcome of that last vote was what Jim had in mind with the motion. So it's okay to- It was not what I had in mind either. I, I, but I thought we were, I maybe misunderstood. I thought we were bound by what had been pre what was in the material, so that's why I, I that's my misunderstanding. But I think the first part is consensus. Second part, 
there's some disagreement, but I, so I would recommend we break it up into two resolutions. Oh, great. So the, what you're saying, what I hear you're saying, Christian, is the vote that just passed, like that, that did, if, that did make effective this part of the resolution. And now the committee, if it wants, can, can fix this part. Sure. That was, okay. that was my idea. Yeah. Okay. Um, was it so, everyone's sense that, that when they were voting this last round, they were just voting on the result? My hands up. No. No? Why don't okay. we just then, do a quick vote? Yeah, let's just do it again. Yeah, just do it again. For just uh, the top part, break it out and just do yeah. two resolutions. Yeah. What I'm going to do is I'm going to, um, I've already copy and pasted it onto a second slide, so I can delete this safely. And okay. we're going to take this out. Can we call it resolution number one and resolution number two? Um, yeah, I'll do it up here. Okay. Just recommended. And then the other one is, is, is sitting on a different slide. Yeah, perfect. Um, great. So we will retake that vote since there was some confusion as to what, what the vote was, what the motion was. And, and it was on staff's part as well, I think. Um, all right, Wait, so we're just voting on the, this part. Is, is, would anyone like to move? I'll move. All right, uh, chair moves. A second? Second. Second. Um, great. I, was that Tammy who spoke first? I, then I... That's fine, yeah. Okay, thank you. And then um, we'll take the vote. So Meeker? Yes. Great. Uh, Iskin? Yes. Mahoney? Yes. Rhinus? Yes. Savage? Yes. And Schreiber? Yes. Great. Motion carries. Um, did I call Iskin? Yes, I did. Okay, motion carries. Uh, and so... Um, we will advance the slide and let's let's wordsmith this one so we can take this out. So it'll be resolution two, uh, and this will just become resolved. It's mm -hmm. Own resolution. Okay. Yes, and and my proposal was is to get rid of the yellow and add a final sentence that says major substantive changes will be done with consultation of the chair. I'm good with that. Wait, it, just to be clear, so we have the highlighted language right there. Comes out. Comes out. And do we have a definition of major substantive changes or not really? Not really. Sorry about the typos. I'm just putting it up, and I obviously we're wordsmithing it, but the committee is wordsmithing it, but um, just putting it up for now so you can see it. Um, yeah, so uh, I mean, just from staff's perspective, the staff will always be in the position of having to figure out um, how, to, how to implement it. Like, does it trigger the need? And uh, I mean, just as a matter of practice, I'll say it out loud, like we'd always check with Jim anyway, but like maybe our successors one day won't want to do that and they'll need to know. So yeah, Duan, do you have thoughts about major substantive? Yeah, I mean, the thing is, Chris and I are conservative, so with lack of like clarity on major, we're going to be checking with Jim about everything, which we do anyways, just to know. We do check with Jim about everything. It's just, if you want the major in there, if you can clarify it for us, at the very least, that would help us for our successors more, because we do check with Jim about everything. It seems to me that if staff defers to Jim now, that it sets sort of a good pattern where rather than misunderstand or misinterpret the phrase major substantive changes, the staff, rather than take a risk that they're misinterpreting this, will bring it to the attention of the committee chair. So I'm not concerned about use of this language without a definition. I feel comfortable with it. I think staff will use it reasonably and responsibly. I agree. Well, do, do we have further discussion? I guess I just, I mean, I'm concerned staff's interpretation of this clause is vague just means they'll, they'll put everything in it. Everything will be a potential major substantive change. 
which it doesn't seem to be your intention. You know, Chris, my view is that different chairs will have a different understanding of what this means. And if staff were to bring every potential change to the attention of the chair, the chair will help to define it during the chair's role as chair. Uh, and the next chair may have a different understanding of it. The vagueness will lead to some variance in the way this is applied. I agree with that, but I don't think it's harmful. Yeah, and I, I would view it as flexibility. Um, as far as I'm concerned, any change in the reporting dates is not a major substantive change. Any changes in the reporting topics, especially if they're eliminating topics that we've already agreed on, would be a major substantive change. And so in consultation with the committee chair, just to be clear, does that mean the committee chair has to know about it, has to approve of it, like to the extent that there's a disagreement? What's the sort of in consultation? Well, I think the chair is acting on behalf of the committee, which acts on behalf of the commission. So yeah. if I think, if I disagree with the staff, this would be something, and if I think it's important, this would be something I would be to bring to the committee as a whole. Yeah. yeah, as a matter of um, kind of consistency and resolution phrasing, um, in consultation is frequently used. It usually refers to having to notify and seek the advice of, but it doesn't mean it has to get the agreement of. So would, I guess what purpose this would serve is it would put the chair on notice that it's happening and the chair could, it would be within the chair's right to call like an emergency meeting, well, 10 days public notice and whatnot, but a meeting of the committee to, and then the committee could you pass a resolution to just course. Um, I think the phrasing that would be necessary for something that requires agreement would be something like an agreement with the committee chair or with the approval of the committee chair, just to flag that. And I'm, I'm, that's the way I interpret it in consultation. I don't think we want to put like the chair has a veto right. I think that's too much of a uh, micromanaging. I think if the chair really opposes it, would bring to the consult, would bring in the rest of the committee to discuss it. And I do want to flag that the the resolution still is with the um, the updates would be necessary to comply with federal requirements. So it's hard to anticipate what would happen, but it, chances are it would just be a, the addition of a requirement because. Um, if the Department of Finance ended up saying, yeah, you know, we actually don't need that data point after all, removing it would not be necessary to comply. So I, I wouldn't have interpreted the resolution to allow staff to remove it. I would, but it would allow staff to add something that do you know, because Bonnie said at the beginning of the meeting, like, do you have this constantly like getting new guidance from the US Treasury? But let us add something. Oh, I put a lot of emphasis on the, the word necessary to comply, this phrase, but um, it's all, it's, you know, different people might interpret it differently. Well, further discussion? Should we put it to a vote? Well, I guess I'll, I'll make the motion since it's my wording. Great. Um, okay, so Meeker moves. Um, I Second. saw that Rich um, raised his hand. Were you seconding? Yes. Okay. Um, all right, I will take the vote. Uh, Meeker? Yes. Uh, Iskin? Yes. Mahoney. Yes. Uh, Rhinus. Yes. Savage. No. And Schreiber. Uh, <laughs> no. Um, uh, so there was it's, uh, four yeses um, and two noes. And um, so I believe that's motion carries. Yeah. So I was just like quorum. We need five for a quorum, yeah, but it's a majority of the members present. So uh, motion carries, Jim. Good, good. So that just leaves the last issue on the agenda. And uh, basically what I wanted to make a proposal to the committee is that uh, we've now had experience with several different ways of doing this uh, discretionary grant processes. We had the early days of the bank grants where every committee member read every single proposal and there was some dissatisfaction with that. Then we had a period where 
the grant proposals were divvied up amongst the committee members and certain subgroups of the committee read certain proposals and other members of the subcommittees read other proposals. And then it was all brought together. Uh, and then we have this procedure that we're following and the partnership grants are following where we have sort of an agreement on the scoring rubric. Then we have a calibration meeting of the committee as a whole for a certain sub grant, sub number, sub number of the grants. And then we have a scoring team that scores all the proposals, which brings any questionable or disagreements to the committee as a whole. And we follow through with that approach. So those are, those are three distinctive different approaches. I think they all have their strengths and weaknesses. I sent uh, an email, I think it was in December, uh, Chris, uh, to you about explaining what I thought the pros and cons were these different ones in terms of measurement validity and reliability. Uh, and I'm gonna ask Chris to distribute that to the rest of the committee. And what I'm suggesting is that after the partnership grants are done, that Eric and I, since Eric has the, he's a victim of chance, I guess, or, or <laughs> whatever, he's on both of these committees. So he's experienced uh, this approach from, from two different committees that Eric and I and staff get together to hash out what we think are the good points or the bad points of the different approaches. And that sometime in the spring that we have a voluntary meeting of anyone in the partnership grants committee or anyone in this committee attend to sort of hash out what we think is maybe the better approach under which circumstances so that we can give that information to the commission as a whole to see whether or not we want to have a sort of default approach or whether or not we want to leave this up to the discretion of each particular committee uh, and on how they handle their discretionary grants. So I'm asking you guys, do you think that's a good idea? And whether or not, Eric, you're willing to participate in doing this? Yeah, of course. Any reactions? Very positive. I, I think that would be a, a, a very good and, and um, helpful discussion to be had and, and perhaps to establish a pattern uh, for the future. I think it's important. Okay, great. Well then, Chris will send out that email that I sent to him last month and uh, to sort of stimulate the discussion. And Eric, when, you, when you've when you recovered from the partnership grant process, <laughs> let, let staff know a time we can set up and, and discuss this further. Sure, of course. Okay, and with that, do I have a motion to adjourn? Oh, I should ask, is our guest still with us? GK client? Uh, yeah, GK. GK client is still still listening. <laughs> uh, give her an opportunity for any further public comment. Or Great. No? I'm going to give you um, the ability to talk in just a second, and then you might have to unmute yourself as well. Um... Hi, again. I'm still here. Um, this has been very interesting and eye-opening, listening in and seeing um, how you guys come together to make decisions. And I have a lot of thoughts and ideas and personal experiences that relate to everything that you talked about. And um, just to make it all clear, personally, I'm really great at writing it out in an email and instead of um, hashing it out um, verbally. But I do wanna say, Christian, I appreciate your um, conservative nature in wanting to clearly define what um, what you guys voted on and not be so open and vague and ambiguous because with my, my personal experience with the dry key stuff is that people um, target these vulnerable groups that rely on these kind of uh, organizations that say that they're helping people and there's a lot of a lot of people that are great at making things look on the outside like they have the right intention and they're doing the right thing but if you look below the surface they don't and if you give people too much room to interpret things in the way that serves them and not the public I'm worried that that will happen um, but there's a lot more to what I just said right there. 
and I um, I am going to put together an email and I will, I think I have the information for Chris, your email through the website. That's right. I'll send yeah. that to you. Yeah, but, my email's on the meeting agenda, so you can still see Yeah, but yeah. I just wanted to um, put that two cents in there and also just say thank you because I know you guys are all volunteering too, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's a lot of work and it's a lot of responsibility. And I appreciate all of you guys coming together and trying to um, help help people in need. Well, thanks, GK client. And I'm sure Chris will send your email to the rest of the committee and we'll all see it. And do we have a motion to adjourn? Actually, Jim, can I can I jump in really quick before we wrap up? Okay. Okay. This is just a, I just want to make sure we're compliant with Bagley Keen Open Meeting Act. So if it's okay, um, before I send your email to all of the commissioners, um, I'm gonna display it. I copy and paste into a Word doc. I'm gonna display it on the screen so that it's part of the public record. Um, just for a moment, you don't have to actually read it, but this way it's captured in the recording. Um, and that way I can send it after the meeting is like, and here's the material that came up at the meeting. And this isn't like a secret thing that happened. Um, let's see. All right. Um, so I'm not going to read this out loud because I, I am going to just forward Jim's email to everyone. But for the public record and the recording, this is the email that staff is going to circulate, the text of the email that staff is going to circulate um, to the committee um, for their, for their um, convenience to access it. Um, and, um, uh, and then uh, just as a friendly reminder, for, for Bagley, Keen is sensitive to what's called like serial meetings, which is where um, commissioners might start to discuss something outside of a, of a publicly noticed in, um, a meeting. So when I circulate this, I'm just going to BCC the listserv and it'll just be me in the, the um, from line. Um, but this can be the basis of a future conversation in a, in a publicly noticed meeting. Okay, that was it. Um, and then and we don't actually need a, um, a motion to adjourn, Jim. If you want to bring it to a close, you can just bring it to a close if you like. Oh, okay. Uh, well, let's bring this to a close then. I guess we end early. Thank you all for your time. Yeah, thank you. We Thanks, everybody. checked every box off. Thank you so much, Jim. <laughs> Thanks, yeah. staff. Appreciate it. Have Bye. a wonderful weekend, everybody. You too. Okay.